anatomy and clinical neurology with special emphasis on the topic of basal ganglia. Basal ganglia has been an important topic right through our MBBS days friends. Right from anatomy to physiology to its application part in medicine. All are important pertaining to the study of basal ganglia. The questions about basal ganglia can be neuro integrated or physio integrated. So let's get started. Let's start with a basic question, my dear friends. Identify the glutaminergic nucleus in the basal ganglia highlighted in the image given below. So, this is the image given, and we need to identify what is the basal ganglia identified in green in the image. Option A, caudate nucleus. Option B, putamen. Option C, subthalamic nucleus. Option D, globus pallidus. This is a type of question where you cannot get right if you are not sure of the anatomy of the basal ganglia. This is a straightforward question. You can get it right or you can get it wrong when you know the anatomy of basal ganglia. Such questions, you need to have 100% knowledge regarding the anatomy. You cannot guess this question based on your guessing knowledge or your learning sequence. You need to know the anatomy, then only you can get this right. You cannot take risks in such type of questions. So, what is, the, what is it which is identified in green? Yes, it is the subthalamic nucleus. So, let's see the anatomy of the basal ganglia. So, this is a coronal section on the front of the brain. So, let's see what are the four basal ganglia. What is this in, encircled in white, my dear friends? Yes, this is the lateral ventricle of the brain. Just lateral to the lateral ventricle is the caudate nucleus. So, the caudate nucleus is just lateral to the lateral ventricle. And what is this, friends? Yes, it is the third ventricle. So, just lateral to the third ventricle is the thalamus and just lateral to the lateral ventricle is the caudate nucleus. This has been asked in multiple exams, friends. You cannot just leave caudate nucleus and thalamus. You must be able to identify them in an anatomical image or in cadaveric image or in radiological image. That's why I'm emphasizing on them more and more. So, just lateral to the lateral ventricle is the caudate nucleus and just lateral to the caudate third ventricle is the thalamus. So, lateral to the caudate nucleus, what is this structure? This is known as the lentiform nucleus with globus pallidus present medially and putamen present laterally. So, globus pallidus is present medially and putamen is present laterally in the lentiform nucleus. Together, the caudate and putamen are functionally related and it is known as the striatum. Don't get confused. The lentiform nucleus with the globus pallidus and putamen are related structurally but caudate nucleus and putamen are functionally related and are known as striatum so just lateral to the lateral ventricle is the caudate nucleus and just lateral to the caudate nucleus is the lentiform nucleus with internally globus pallidus and externally putamen so we saw that it is the thalamus which is just lateral to the third ventricle just below the thalamus is a subthalamic nucleus. So, this is the thalamus and just below the thalamus which is identified in yellow is a subthalamic nucleus. So, this is what stands for the subthalamic nucleus. So, in blue are the subthalamic nucleus just below the thalamus and thalamus can be identified just lateral to the third ventricle. And just below the thalamus what we can find are the substantia nigra. The substantia nigra are present just below the thalamus. So, on the whole, just lateral to the lateral ventricle is the caudate nucleus, and then just lateral to the lateral ventricle is the caudate nucleus, and just lateral to the third ventricle is the thalamus, and below thalamus you can find the subthalamic nucleus and the substantia nigra, and lateral to the thalamus and caudate nucleus you can find the lentiform nucleus with the globus pallidus present internally and putamen present laterally. Again, I would like to emphasize a boomerang shaped swelling, boomerang shaped white fibers, white matter fibers present between caudate and thalamus and globus pallidus. So, what is it called, friends? These white matter fibers present between the caudate and the thalamus in the brain. Yes, it is an internal capsule. 
so they are the internal capsule and they are bounded medially by the caudate nucleus in the thalamus and laterally by the globus pallidus. Once again, another different and clear image to identify the basal ganglia. So this is the lateral ventricle and lateral to the lateral ventricle is the caudate nucleus and we can see this is the third ventricle and this is the thalamus and below the thalamus you can find the subthalamic nucleus in the substantia nigra and this is the globus pallidus present medially and putamen present laterally together they form the lentiform nucleus so this is the caudate lentiform nucleus substantia subthalamic nucleus and substantia nigra again this is the boomerang shaped white matter fibers present between the caudate nucleus and thalamus medially and lentiform nucleus laterally and it is nothing but the internal capsule this image has to be embarked into your minds you cannot just dare to forget this image you must be able to identify both anatomically and radiologically the thalamus and the caudate nucleus and the internal capsule this has been tested in multiple exams both neat and names function of the basal ganglia the basic and the most important function of basal ganglia is planning and programming of the movements. So, whenever there is any disease of the basal ganglia, there is loss of the planning and programming of the movements, resulting in abnormal and involuntary movements. Let's see what each type of basal ganglia disease leads to. Hemibellismus. It is wild, forceful, incessant movements that occur on one side of the body. There is nothing to memorize in this. Hemibellismus, it itself sees on one side of the body. But you need to remember that they are wild, forceful, forceful and incessant movements. And they occur due to the lesion of... Hemibellismus occurs due to the lesion of subthalamic nucleus, which we identified in our last slide. Ethitosis. Ethitosis are slow, breathing movements of the fingers, most commonly in the upper limbs involving the hands of the hands of the arm so arms of the hand so the fingers of the arm are most commonly involved in ethitosis these are slow breathing movements of the fingers chorea it involves rapid jerky purposeful or semi purposeful again this is an important mcq friends purposeless or semi purposeful movements are seen in chorea whereas both hemibalismus and ethitosis are purposeless movements but chorea they can be semi-purposeful movements, irregular or jerky movements, which are also referred to as classically dance-like involuntary movements. So, hemibolismus is violent and incessant movement. Ethitosis is slow breathing movement, especially the fingers of the hand are involved. And chorea, it is dance-like movement. And remember friends, it can be purposeful or semi-purposeful. So, let's see the differences between these three movements because this has been tested in multiple number of examinations. Firstly, you can see that all three of them are involuntary. Both chorea, hemibellismus and ethitosis, all three of them are involuntary. So, they are not voluntary and they are basically due to the lesions of the basal ganglia. Basal ganglia, the chief function is coordination of motor movements. So, whenever there is no coordination of the motor movement, it leads to irregular involuntary movements known as chorea, ethitosis and bellismus. So all of them are involuntary and all of them are non-stereotypical movements. But I am again emphasizing that chorea is dance-like movement and it can be semi-purposeful or non-purposeful whereas bellismus and ethitosis both are non-purposeful movements. Chorea is dance-like movement, bellismus is violent movement you need to remember this word violent flinging movement of one half of the body. That's why it is called hemibellismus. Ethitosis is slow rhythmic movements of the hands of the arm. Chorea more on the distal side. Ethitosis also more on the distal side affecting the upper limb. And but hemibellismus is more on the proximal side. So this is one differentiates hemibellismus and this one semi-purposeful or non-purposeful movements differentiates chorea from the rest of the two. You can see that both chorea and bellismus are rapid, but ethitosis is slow rhythmic movements. So any movement which is slow is termed to be ethitosis. So this is this is a must MCQ in any type of exam, whether it is neat or in AIDS. So you must be thorough with them. 
Let us see various diseases affecting the basal ganglia and producing the characteristic symptoms. So, degeneration of the substantia nigra. Can you name it, friends? Degeneration of the dopaminergic neurons of the substantia nigra results in which disease? I have been emphasizing on this disease since the last three classes. Yes, it is the Parkinson's disease. Degeneration of the dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra leads to the Parkinson's disease. What is the classical triad of the Parkinson's disease? Yes, it is rigidity, tremor, and a kinesia. Degeneration of the subthalamic degeneration of the subthalamic nucleus. Like I already described, degeneration of the subthalamic nucleus, which we identified below the thalamus, it leads to hemibelismus. It is violent flinging movements of one half of the body and it is more prog more important proximally hemibalismus affects proximal organs more commonly than the distal but chorea and ichthyosis more merely present as distal movement disorders globus pallidus can any one of you say when the globus pallidus is affected in which type of psychiatric or neuropsychiatric disorder Yes, it is the ethytosis. Ethytosis affects the globus pallidus. When the lentiform nucleus is affected, it results in with psychiatric disorder. Lentiform nucleus. Copper getting deposited in the lentiform nucleus, characteristically seen in which disease? Yes, it is the Wilson's disease. So, copper being deposited in the Wilson's disease leading to the lentiform, in the lentiform nucleus leading to the Wilson's disease. So, you can see that in substantia nigra, degeneration of the dopaminergic neurons leads to Parkinson's disease and contralateral subthalamic nucleus involvement leads to hemibelismus and contralateral globus pallidus involvement leads to ethytosis and contralateral caudate nucleus involvement leads to, yes, it is chorea. So, caudate nucleus involvement leading to chorea Contralateral globus pallidus involvement leading to ethytosis. Contralateral subthalamic nucleus leading to hemibelismus. It is the contralateral nucleus which, con which controls this side of the body. So this representation is important. And this question has been asked multiple number of times. Hemibelismus leads leading to contralateral subthalamic nucleus damage. This question has been asked in the NEET 2016 exam. So basically, Korea, as we already saw, it is dance like involuntary movement, purposeful or semi purposeful movement, whereas both ethytosis and bellismus and hemibellismus were purposeless movements. Huntington's chorea, we already read about it in our previous video. Huntington's chorea manifests at a young age and it is due to the which type of repeats, which type of trinucleotide repeats leads to Huntington's chorea. Yes, it is the CAG repeats which lead to Huntington's chorea. And it affects the caudate nucleus and manifests early. Sindenham's chorea is the chorea following streptococcal infection and manifestation of rheumatic heart disease and it is one of the major criteria in the diagnosis of rheumatic heart disease. We diagnose rheumatic fever with a, even on a single case of Sindenham's chorea even without the manifestations of the heart disease or manifestations of the mitral valve involvement. Sindenham's chorea basically involves multiple small lesions in the putamen. So there are basically three types of chorea. Sindenham's chorea in rheumatic heart disease, Huntington's chorea, caudate nucleus, CAG repeats leading to purposeless movements in the childhood and again chorea gravidorum which is seen in pregnancy. So this is all about chorea and again chorea is due to the involvement of the caudate nucleus, contralateral caudate nucleus whereas subthalamic nucleus leads to hemibelismus. Yes. So, let's see the structural and the functional components of basal ganglia. The structural components of basal ganglia basically include the corpus striatum, which is also known as the Wilson's pencil. It is derived from the telencephalon. So, anything derived from telencephalon constitutes the structural component of the basal ganglia, whereas the functional components of the basal ganglia include the subthalamic nucleus in the substantia nigra because they are not derived from the telencephalon. The subthalamic nucleus is derived from the diencephalon. 
we already saw that the, th the subthalamic nucleus lies below the thalamus and thalamus is derived from diencephalon so subthalamic nucleus is also derived from the diencephalon substantia nigra is derived from the mesencephalon that is the midbrain substantia nigra are nothing but the inclusions present in the midbrain we know that the midbrain is derived from the mesencephalon so substantia nigra are also derived from the mesencephalon Question number two. This is also basic and a simple question tested multiple times. Need 2018 question. What are the type of fibers present in the white matter, white matter of the brain in the image given below? So you saw the image. What are the fibers, type of fibers present in the image given below? Option A, commissural fibers. Option B, association fibers. Option C, projection fibers. Option D, all of the above. Yes, any guesses? Yes, it is the internal capsule which is being depicted in the image and the type of fibers in the internal capsule are the projection fibers. Again, I like to emphasize this is the lateral ventricle and just lateral to the lateral ventricle is the caudate nucleus. This is the third ventricle and just lateral to this is the thalamus and lateral to this is the lentiform nucleus as we saw. So this is the caudate and this is the thalamus and this is the lentiform nucleus and the the internal capsule is bounded medially by the caudate nucleus and the thalamus and it is bounded laterally by the lentiform nucleus. So laterally by lentiform nucleus, medially by the caudate nucleus and the thalamus. This is what constitutes the internal capsule. Internal capsule is a must question in any central institute exam. You must be thorough with the boundaries and the constituents and the parts of the internal capsule. So basically, internal capsule is bounded medially by quadrate nucleus and thalamus and laterally by the lentiform nucleus. So I would take this as an opportunity to discuss as that about the types of white matter fibers. There are three types of white matter fibers. The one we saw are the projection fibers, but basically the most important ones are the commissural fibers. Commissural fibers connect the same cortical areas in the two different cerebral hemispheres. Basically, they are the most abundant fibers and as we all know the most important type of commissural fibers is corpus callosum and the anterior commissure. No need to remember anterior commissure because the word itself has a commissure so it is a commissural fiber. Corpus callosum connects the two different cerebral hemispheres so it is also a commissural fiber. Association fibers are the fibers which connect the cortical areas within the same cerebral hemisphere. So, the cortical areas within the same cerebral hemisphere are connected by the association fibers within two different cerebral hemispheres are connected by the commissural fibers. Example of association fiber, Ames number 2018 question, fornix. Fornix is a type of association fiber that connects the hippocampus to the mammillary body. Again, I would like to emphasize if it is a PGI question and multiple correct answers can be given, then you will say that fornix contains all the three types of fibers that is commissural fibers, association fibers, and projection fibers. But if it is an AIMS examination and the answer has to be straight and you need to select only one option, then you would like that Fornix contains association fibers. It connects the hippocampus with the mammillary body. Projection fibers. They connect the cortical area to the subcortical area. Classically, as we saw in the image, the type of projection fibers we commonly refer to is the internal capsule. So three types of white matter fibers are present, commissural fibers, association fibers, and the projection fibers. Question number three. What are the type of fibers present in the white matter of the brain in the image given below? One more image. Let's see. Yes, friends. What are these type of fibers? Yes. If it is an AIMS question, you need to answer only one thing, it is the fornix and you need to say that the fornix contains, fornix contains which type of fibers? Yes, the association fibers, but if it is a PGI question, you can mark all of the above. So I have given all of the above in this question, so the answer can be all of the above more than association fibers. So basically, fornix stands for association fibers and if it's a PGI question, you can answer all of the above. So, let's see the type of fibers 
the and the representation of the corpus callosum and the fornix. This is sagittal, sagittal section of the brain showing the corpus callosum. This is the corpus callosum of the brain. And below this is the septum pellucidum and below this is the fornix. So it basically emphasizes the sagittal section of the brain and this is the medial surface of the brain and this is the corpus callosum. Below this is the septum pellucidum and below the septum pellucidum is the fornix. So corpus callosum, septum pellucidum and the fornix and where are we standing friends? What is this representing? Yes, what is this representing? Yes, which ventricle of the brain? Yes, it is representing the third ventricle of the brain. Let us look at one more section. This was the classical Ames November 2018 question and NEED 2018 question. What is the part of the brain represented in the image? Yes, this is the phonics of the brain which is represented. Again, let's discuss this is the corpus callosum. Below it is the septum pellucidum. And this is the white matter fibers which we can see it is nothing but the phonics. And below the phonics, what we can see is the third ventricle. So just get oriented to the anatomy, both the coronal section and the sagittal section, because this image has been asked in multiple examinations. So this is the corpus callosum, and below this is the septum pellucidum, and below this you can see the phonix, and below the phonix you can find the third ventricle. Again, you can see this is a coronal section of the brain showing the corpus callosum and below this you can see the septum pellucidum and below this you can see the fornix. So again this is the corpus callosum fibers connecting from the frontal lobe this forms the forceps minor and which are connecting the occipital lobe these form the forceps major. Forceps minor and forceps major can also be asked in any entrance examination. So you can clearly emphasize this is the corpus callosum, below this is the septum pellucidum and below it is the fornix. So this is the white matter fiber constituting the fornix clearly marked in the image. So this is the fornix and above it is the corpus callosum. Where we are standing, we are standing at the third ventricle and this is the sagittal section of the brain. So from above downward, you must be oriented to this nomenclature, corpus callosum, septum pellucidum, fornix. And below we have third ventricle and just lateral to third ventricle what can you find yes it is the thalamus so this is the image we discussed multiple times the what are the fibers representing to this is the fornix and above it is the corpus callosum and below this is the septum pellucidum again this has been the latest aims pattern question sequence based question are very very important in AIMS examination. They can make or break your rank because they carry a score of plus one and also a penalty of minus one. So it is very very important to attend them mindfully because they can eat away your marks in a real examination. So sequence based questions are a must question and they can make or break your rank. And you must attempt the question only and only if you are sure of all the options in the question. I have emphasized about this in my topic on aim for aims and how to prepare for aims examination in the sequence of attempting the questions. There I mentioned that these are the dangerous questions and need to be attempted at the end because they eat up all your time and you are given with a penalty of minus one even if you get one sequence wrong in the entire sequence. So even if you get one question wrong like there are seven options even if you get one question wrong then the entire sequence go wrong and you will be awarded with a minus one mark. So answer these questions carefully. You can refer to my video on aim for aims and in which I have uh, explained in detail about the type of questions you need to be attempting. So let's see what is the question. Arrange the following structures of the brain from lateral to medial in the image given below. Again, this is the twist in the question. It is identifying from lateral to medial. We usually tend to read from medial to lateral. You can get the sequence wrong if you read the question in an otherwise hurried manner. So read the question patiently and then only you'll need to get the right answer. So arrange the following structures in the brain from lateral to medial. This is a cadaveric image of the brain. Cadaveric images of the brain have been tested in multiple aims examination 
in AIMS number 2018 as well as in AIMS number 2019 cadaveric images sonars. So you need to identify and label the organs in the cadaveric images itself. So let's see where to start. So the options given are insula, third ventricle, internal capsule, external capsule, lentiform nucleus and the claustrum. Let's see in detail about the approach to this sequence based question. So this is the image of the brain shown friends and here you can clearly identify that like I already mentioned this is the lateral ventricle of the brain so this is the caudate this is the third ventricle of the brain so this is the thalamus and this is the lentiform nucleus and between these two is the is the internal capsule so between these two is the internal capsule and this is the caudate and this is the thalamus and this is the lentiform nucleus with the globus pallidus medially and putamen placed laterally so this is simple and we have discussed this point multiple number of times So that is the caudate just lateral to the lateral ventricle and that is the thalamus just lateral to the third ventricle. So in any CT or MRI image, first identify the lateral ventricle or the third ventricle. Then you can reach to the caudate or thalamus quite easily. Again, you can see that is the lentiform nucleus with globus pallidus medially and putamen placed laterally. But again, one more gray matter or the nuclei present just lateral to the lentiform nucleus is the claustrum. So this is the claustrum just lateral to the lentiform nucleus and the claustrum divides the white matter fibers into two. Medial to the claustrum is the external capsule and lateral to the claustrum is the extreme capsule. So medial to the claustrum is the external capsule and lateral to the claustrum is the extreme capsule. So this is the claustrum, the gray matter just lateral to the lentiform nucleus and then you will get medial to the claustrum you can identify it is the external capsule because the internal capsule is already medial to the lentiform nucleus and lateral to the capsule is the extreme capsule. So external capsule and extreme capsule are to be identified in relation to the claustrum. Claustrum is, has no different function but it is just related to the external capsule and the extreme capsule. And the lateral most structure lateral to the extreme capsule is this area which is insula. Insula has been asked in Ames number 2016 question. The lateral most structure just lateral to the claustrum is the insula and it has to be identified in any examination. So insula is the lateral most structure just lateral to the extreme capsule. This figure clearly emphasizes the claustrum which is marked in red and just medial to the claustrum is the external capsule and later to the colostrum is the extreme capsule. So this is what stands for the external capsule. And this stands for the extreme capsule. And just lateral to the colostrum is the insula. And medial to the colostrum, the gray matter area is known as lentiform nucleus. So this is the cadaveric image demonstrating beautifully the claustrum which is marked in red and just medial to the claustrum is the external capsule and lateral to the claustrum is the extreme capsule and marked in pink is the insula which is the most lateral most structure. So can you put this in sequence from lateral to medial? First thing I would put is insula. Yes. I will keep this image and arrange these things in sequence with me. Let's get started. The first thing is the insula. It is the lateral most structure. Lateral most structure, insula, so it has been ruled out. Chest medial to the insula is the extreme capsule. And in between is the claustrum. And medial to claustrum is the external capsule. So this is a set, friends. You need to remember these three as a set. Extreme capsule, claustrum, and the external capsule. And what is present medial to the external capsule? Yes, what is present medial to the external capsule? Yes, it is the lentiform nucleus. And what is present medial to the lentiform nucleus? Yes, it is the internal capsule. So, read with me friends. This is the insula and medial to the insula is the extreme capsule and medial to this is the claustrum and medial to claustrum is the external capsule. So, I am reading these through as a set of claustrum. 
so claustrum external and extreme capsule laterally is the insula insula followed by claustrum then we have the lentiform nucleus then we have the internal capsule and then we have the thalamus thalamus below and caudate nucleus above and then we have the third ventricle so from lateral to medial this is the sequence so once again let's discuss the sequence from lateral to medial so this is the insula which is the lateral most structure and then we have the claustrum with the external and extreme capsule and then we have the lentiform nucleus and medial to lentiform nucleus we have the internal capsule and medial to the internal capsule we have the thalamus thalamus below and caudate nucleus above and then we have the medial most as a third ventricle so it doesn't sound it sounds difficult but if it isn't difficult if they are hundred percent knowledge of the anatomy of the brain so it is the lentiform nucleus followed by internal capsule and then the caudate nucleus in the thalamus followed by in third ventricle which is present the most medial so this is the sequence from lateral to medial in the kernel section of the brain and this can be a potential mcq again you must be able to correlate your anatomical knowledge with your radiological knowledge because the trend has been asking the ct and mri images and thereby identifying the anatomy so once again read with me this is the lateral most structure you saw and this is the insula and then we have the claustrum with external and extreme capsule and we have this here as the putamen again friends on the radiology putamen is hyper intense whereas globus pallidus is hypo intense so this is the lentiform nucleus you can clearly make out the putamen is hyper intense and globus pallidus is hyper in hypo intense so you cannot see this differentiation in the anatomical image and in radiological image this differentiation is apt and this is the head of caudate nucleus just lateral to the lateral ventricle and this is the third ventricle and you can identify this big structure this is the thalamus and below thalamus you can find the subthalamic nucleus and this is the boomerang shaped white matter fibers emerging between the caudate nucleus and thalamus medially and lentiform nucleus laterally this is the internal capsule so caudate nucleus thalamus lentiform nucleus and this is the internal capsule you can clearly see that the globus pallidus is lighter in color and the putamen is darker in color again friends i would like to emphasize this are the forceps minor fibers connecting the two frontal lobes and this is the forceps major fibers connecting the two occipital lobes so forceps minor and forceps major are very very important fibers again this is the insula of the brain which is the lateral most structure lateral most structure insula claustrum globus pallidus and then we have the internal capsule with thalamus and the third ventricle again this is the forceps major and this is a sorry forceps minor which is connecting the frontal lobe and this is the forceps major which is connecting the occipital lobes again the internal capsule has been again divided into anterior limb and which is a genu and then posterior limb and the subthalamic and the retro lentiform part so this is the anterior limb of the internal capsule again we have seen one more relation of the corpus callosum let's see this here corpus callosum and again we got the septum pellucidum and this white matter fiber what is it called friend it is the fornix and below the fornix you have the third ventricle so corpus callosum and below you have the septum pellucidum and then the white matter fiber known as the fornix which is chiefly the association fibers connecting the hippocampus to the mammillary body and below it is the third ventricle so corpus callosum septum pellucidum and fornix so this integrate the findings of all the basal ganglia and the relations to the internal capsule so let's see at the clinical question question number six this is a long question friends use your mind and then answer a 25 year old male presented with one year history of progressive postural instability and dysarthria associated with ataxia and extrapyramidal signs he has also been having depressive symptoms and personality changes over the past three years as observed by his father his mother has also psychiatric illness for which she is on treatment clinical examination finding and mri imaging are shown below identify the disease so let's see the mri and the clinical findings this is the image of the eye showing a characteristic can anyone of you identify this this is the MRI brain with the characteristic finding shown by the arrows. 
can you identify what is the disease Which of the following B cell nuclei is earliest involved in this disease? Again friends, knowing that disease is itself is not enough. You need to know which of the B cell nuclei is earliest involved in the disease. This is where the beauty of integration lies. We have given a long clinical scenario with ophthalmologic finding and radiological finding. So it is a medicine case coming to your OPD who have gone to ophthalmologist and a radiologist for consultation and they are asking a question on the anatomy. Which of the following basal nuclei is earliest involved in the disease? So you need to have a complete integrated knowledge to answer such type of questions. You cannot just mug up the facts and answer these questions. So which of the following basal nuclei is earliest involved in this disease? Subthalamic nucleus, lentiform nucleus, caudate nucleus or the substantia nigra. One more thing friends. It is the basal nuclei which is the more appropriate term and the ganglia is a wrong term. It is most commonly used but the ganglia is the collection of neuronal cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system and the term ganglia is no longer used because it is the collection of neuronal cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system as basal ganglia are located in the brain which constitutes the central nervous system so it is the basal nuclei which is the most appropriate term for this. You cannot call it basal ganglia. More appropriately if the term basal nuclei is given you need to go with the term in the answer. So that's just an apprehension that we use the term basal ganglia more commonly than basal nuclei but more correct terminology is using basal nuclei. So what is the disease friends? Yes, it is characteristically showing hyper intensities in the caudate and the putamen with the characteristic ophthalmologic finding that is the KF ring. It is nothing but the Wilson's disease with characteristic deposits in the putamen Putamin is the first nucleus to be involved in the Wilson's disease. I am looking for putamin. Putamin. Yes, the lentiform nucleus includes the putamin and the globus pallidus. So, it is the putamin which is characteristically first involved in the, in the Wilson's disease where copper gets deposited. So, my answer would be lentiform nucleus. Let's, let's discuss about the approach to Wilson's disease. A 25 year old male presented with one year history of progressive postural instability and dysarthria. So, motor symptoms are there associated with ataxia and extrapyramidal signs as well. So, we saw that the ataxia is a sign of cerebellar disease, and extrapyramidal signs are signs of basal ganglia region. So, the both features of ataxia, that is cerebellar signs, and extrapyramidal signs, that is chorea, ethetosis, and hemibalismus, and dysarthria. So, pyramidal and cerebellar and extrapyramidal signs are also seen. He has been also shown having depressive symptoms and personality changes. So, depressive symptoms and personality changes are also seen in the patient over the past three years. As observed by his father, his mother also has psychiatric illness. So, family history is also present. Clinical examination and findings are present. So, classically, we saw the image of the Kersner Fischer ring, Kaiser Fischer ring, which is also known as the KF ring. So the KF ring or the case of Fleischer ring classically seen in the eye which is with character characteristically copper gets deposited in which layer of the cornea. There is a potential MCQ. Which layer of the cornea the KF ring is seen? Yes, it is a test mates membrane where the copper gets deposited which showing hyper intensities in the caudate nucleus and the putamen. And remember friends, putamen is the first one to be involved and the caudate nucleus in the putamen is the earliest sign of the Wilson's disease. And this is a case of Wilson's disease presented with neurological features predominantly. Again friends, what is this MRI? It is T2 weighted MRI or T1 weighted MRI? T2 weighted or T1 weighted MRI? Yes, I have already emphasized how to differentiate between T2 weighted and T2 weighted MRI. You can see that it is the CSF within the ventricle which is white. So water is white in T2 weighted MRI and white matter is white in T1 weighted MRI. So water is white so this is a T2 weighted MRI and you can characteristically see the hyper intensities in the putamen and the caudate nucleus which is the earliest finding in the Wilson's disease. So let's see about the normal pathway of copper absorption in our human body. We can see that the copper gets absorbed in the duodenum. So like all the bivalent metal ions like iron which also gets maximum absorbed in the duodenum Copper also gets absorbed maximum in the duodenum by a pit 
particular transporter which is the ATP 7A transporter. So it is the ATP 7A transporter which is chiefly involved in the transport of copper from the duodenum to the liver. So it reaches the liver through the portal vein and then it reaches the liver through the portal vein and then in the liver it gets engulfed into the hepatocytes. Inside the hepatocyte it gets bounded to the epocelloplasmin which is the copper binding protein by with the help of a gene which is the ATP7B gene. So it gets engulfed into the epocelloplasmin with the help of a gene which is the ATP7B gene. So this ATP7B gene is the gene which is defective in Wilson's disease and this ATP7B gene is responsible for the incorporation of copper into the epocelloplasmin. So this gene is responsible for the incorporation of copper into epocelloplasmin and again this gene is also responsible for the excretion of copper via the liver through the bile. So ATP7B gene is not only engulfing epocelloplasmin with, with copper but it is also responsible for the biliary excretion of copper. So that epocelloplasmin is circulated freely in the blood as celloplasmin and is distributed to various organs of the body. Again, it is important to remember friends, it is that 85% of the copper is freely is not at all absorbed and is excreted as metalloporphyrin from metalloporphyrin. So 85% of, of the copper is actually left out as it is in the feces only 50% is absorbed from ATP 7A where in the liver it is integrated with epocelloplasmin with the help of ATP 7B protein and also ATP 7B is res responsible for the biliary excretion of copper and epocelloplasmin reaches the blood epocelloplasmin plus copper is nothing but celloplasmin it reaches the blood and circulates freely in the blood so these are the much known facts about copper metabolism only 25% of the copper is absorbed by the liver, rest is excreted as such in the, fetus, in the feces. Most of the copper is transported into serum as celloplasmin, so there is no free copper circulating in the body. Excess copper is excreted by bile again via ATP 7 B gene. Less than 5% of the copper in serum is in free form and is excreted via kidney. So free copper is totally rare in the body and kidney excretion or urinary, uh, urinary excretion of copper is almost nil because we saw there are only two major routes of excretion of copper the one through the feces which is not absorbed which is the 85 percent part and again another 10 percent is, uh, is excreted via atp 7b through the biliary excretion from the liver the third form which is excreted which is the free form this free form of copper is rarely seen and this free form is excreted via the kidney so let's see what is wrong in the Wilson's disease. We can see that in Wilson's disease, the ATP 7B is classically normal. So this ATP 7A is classically normal. This gene, this protein is affected in Menke's disease. So this is Menke's disease or lysyl oxidase gene defect, which results in ATP 7A gene mutation and absorption of copper or small intestinal villi absorption of copper is affected. So this is ATP 7A gene which is affected in Menke's disease and ATP 7B gene which is affected in Wilson's disease. So there is no incorporation of copper into the epocelloplasmin and therefore the free copper is seen in the blood and is excreted via the kidney. So there is no biliary excretion of copper as well and there is no incorporation into epocelloplasmin this free copper accumulates in the liver and primarily leads to hepatotoxicity and this free copper also spills up into circulation causing the neurological and ocular findings get deposited in the eyes in the desmets membrane leading to case of pressure. So basically it is an autosomal recessive type of inheritance. Don't get confused friends it is an autosomal recessive type of inheritance which is characteristically due to the mutation in the ATP 7B mutation, whereas ATP 7A mutation was seen in Menke's disease. Mutation causes a decrease in copper transport in the bile, impairs its incorporation into celloplasmin, inhibits the celloplasmin secretion into the blood. Thereby, you can see the free copper is excreted into the serum and the free copper in the blood increases and urinary excretion of copper increases. This is a must MCQ in any examination. Urinary excretion of copper is the single best test in the diagnosis of Wilson's disease. 
So urinary excretion of copper is the single best test in the diagnosis of Wilson's disease. So as I already discussed, the primary target of organ of damage is liver. As both biliary excretion of copper is affected and incorporation into epocelloplasmin is affected. So the copper destroys the liver accumulating in the hepatocytes. When this copper spills into circulation, they cause damage to other organs resulting in hemolysis. Mind you friends, it is Coombs negative hemolytic anemia. Many of us tend to confuse and put it as Coombs positive hemolytic anemia. So whenever a question of Wilson's disease is asked and which is not true about the condition, look for this option. Coombs positive hemolytic anemia is not seen. It is Coombs negative hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia. Pre-copper can damage the liver and result in acute tubular necrosis deposited in the cornea and the lens. Again, deposited in the cornea or the desmet membrane of the cornea leading to the characteristic finding of the kaiser fleischer ring. When this copper, though rare, it gets deposited in the lens, then it is known as copper deposited in the lens produces the features of yes, it is the sunflower fat trap. So in the cornea, depositing in the cornea, it produces KF ring or the Kaiser Fleischer ring. When it gets deposited in the lens, it produces the sunflower cataract. It may get deposited in the bone joints and also in the parathyroid. And last but not the least, it gets deposited in the central nervous system or the blood crosses the blood brain barrier and gets deposited in the basal ganglia, producing characteristically extra pyramidal symptoms and also the cerebellar symptoms like we saw in our patient so basically the diagnosis of Wilson's disease depends on a number of factors blood obviously the ceruloplasmin levels would decrease but again remember friend serum ceruloplasmin levels may be normal in a case of Wilson's disease yes ceruloplasmin levels may be slight to normal or low to normal in a case of Wilson's disease and serum copper levels may not help in a case of Wilson's disease it is always, always the urine sample which is important in a case of Wilson's disease where there is increase in the urinary excretion of copper in a case of Wilson's disease. Again, liver biopsy can demonstrate the excess of copper in a case of Wilson's disease. There are two stains which are used to demonstrate copper. It is the rhodamine and the rhodonine stain for copper and the arsine stain which stains for the copper associated proteins. Again, Biopsy has limited role nowadays and liver biopsy is rarely done. One more question to you friends. Which organ do you biopsy when there is ATP 7A mutation or Menkes disease? What is the investigation of choice to diagnose Menkes disease or ATP 7A mutation? Yes, it is a small intestine because there is impaired absorption of the copper from the small intestine leading to accumulation in the Small intestine. In small intestinal biopsy is the diagnosis or the investigation of choice in Menkes disease. Again, the gold standard is copper in excess of 250 microgram per gram per gram derivative of liver is the diagnostic or the gold standard in the diagnosis of Wilson's disease. So it is not the biopsy which is diagnostic of Wilson's disease. It is the copper weight in excess of 250 microgram per gram of dry weight of liver which is the diagnostic of the Wilson's disease. Harrison's mentions it to be 200 microgram per gram of the liver or it can be 250 microgram as per Robbins. So it is a copper in excess of 250 microgram per gram of dry weight of the liver is the diagnostic of Wilson's disease where the biopsy is not the gold standard but this weight of copper is the gold standard. Again, I would emphasize that it is the urinary copper which is increased and increase in the urinary excretion of copper is practically the most possible test you can do in your clinic. So increase in the urinary excretion of copper is the one which is used in the diagnosis of Wilson's disease. So urinary excretion of copper is the most important and the most sensitive test in the diagnosis of Wilson's disease. Liver biopsy is not specific as there are many conditions including drug induced and viral hepatitis where the copper deposition will be more. So we tend to feel that liver biopsy is the investigation of choice or the gold standard in the diagnosis of Wilson's disease. But no, it is the gold standard which is the weight of copper. Copper in excess of 250 microgram per gram dry weight of liver is diagnostic of Wilson's disease. Let's see the liver biopsy stain demonstrating 
the excess copper within the hepatocytes of the liver. What is the stain used here, friends? I already said about it. What is the stain used here? This can be a potential visual MCQ. Yes, the stain used here is the rhodonine or the rhodamine stain for copper. Again, friends, there can be a hepatic presentation or neurological presentation of the patient of Wilson's disease. A patient of Wilson's can present in both ways. Like in our case, there are neurological presentation with cerebellar signs and extrapyramidal symptoms and dysarthria and other features of the involving the brain. There can be hepatic presentation also involving jaundice, fever, acute hepatic decompensation or chronic viral hepatitis like picture with superimposed Coombs negative hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia. So the patient can pre present with jaundice and other signs related to liver failure or the patient can also present with cerebellar and extrapyramidal signs related to the involvement of the brain and the basal ganglia. So there can be two types of presentations of Wilson's disease, a neurological Wilson's or a hepatic Wilson. So the hepatic presentation involves slowly progressive hepatic failure with cirrhosis, mimicking acute viral hepatitis that is your closest differential diagnosis, mimicking autoimmune chronic active hepatitis and it, it can also lead to acute fulminant hepatic failure. Fulminant hepatic failure is the hepatic failure occurring within four days of the onset of the disease. Neurological presentation of Wilson's is more commonly seen and the neurological presentation inc includes tremor, dystonia, chorea, ethitosis, Parkinsonism, and myoclonia. So, neurological Wilson include tremor, dystonia, chorea, ethitosis, or Parkinsonism. All these are features of involvement of the basal ganglia, or it can also involve the cerebellar dysfunction, or combined dysfunction of cerebellum or basal ganglia producing dysarthria and dysphysia. Other features such as autonomic dysfunction or seizure can also be seen. Most commonly, it mimics acute viral hepatitis or jaundice, or a neurological Wilson present with, presenting with the involvement of the basal ganglia and the first basal ganglia to be involved is putamen. Yes, putamen followed by caudate nucleus is the first basal ganglia finding. So let us see at the ocular findings of a patient of Wilson's. KF ring or the case of Flesher ring is the most common ocular finding in a patient of Wilson's. Remember friends, you don't need a slit lamp to diagnose or demonstrate KF ring. Copper deposition typically occurs at the Desmet's membrane, earliest seen on gonioscopy. Can you say why? Why KF ring is earliest seen on gonioscopy? Yes, it is because copper deposition occurs at the Desmet membrane and the Desmet membrane is clearly seen in the angle of the eye on, that is on gonioscopy that is on the Schwalbe's base line. So the Schwalbe's base line where the copper is earliest deposited can be seen on gonioscopy. So gonioscopy is usually used to identify the disorders of the angle of the eye, but gonioscopy can be used to identify or diagnose a case of Wilson's disease. This has been a potential AIMS MCQ. So gonioscopy is used for the earliest diagnosis of Wilson's disease where you demonstrate a KF ring. Of course, you, you can use a flip lamp for better verification of your diagnosis, but flip lamp is usually not needed for the diagnosis of KF ring or Kaiser Flesher ring. KF ring of Wilson's disease. This is very important, friends. This is the correlation of ophthalmology and medicine. When you find a KF ring in a patient of Wilson's disease, then it is likely that it is more commonly neurological Wilson's than the hepatic Wilson's because KF ring is seen in 95% of the patients with neurological Wilson's, whereas it is seen in 65% of the patients with hepatic Wilson's. So KF ring almost includes neurological Wilson's. This was same with our case as well. He was presenting with features of cerebellar and basal ganglia dysfunction and KF ring was seen. Successful treatment causes disappearance in 80 to 95 percent of the patients. The successful treatment, the KF ring disappears in 80 to 90 percent of the patients. What is the treatment of choice for Wilson's disease? That is the drug of choice. Yes, it is the zinc and the triantin which are used for the treatment of Wilson's disease. Zinc and triantin are used for the treatment of Wilson's disease. Of course, when it is acute uh, decompensated failure or anything, you can go for shunts or liver transplant as well. But the drugs of choice are zinc and triantin. So this is the classical KF ring deposited at the periphery of the cornea, that is at the Desmet's membrane, 
this can be seen without a slit lamp. Again, this is the classical KF ring seen at the periphery of the cornea. You get confused with the KF ring and the arcus senilis. Arcus senilis also presents at the periphery of the cornea, but it is white in color. Arcus senilis also presents like this, but it is white in color and KF ring is brownish in color. Again, the copper deposition in the eye can occur in the cornea as well as in the lens. If the copper deposition in the eye occurs in the lens, then how does it manifest? Deposition of the copper in the lens presents as Yes, it is the sunflower cataract. So this is the classical depiction of the sunflower cataract presenting at the center of the lens, the copper which is presenting at the periphery. The periphery of the lens, the copper is getting deposited, classically described as the sunflower of the cataract. Sunflower cataract. Mind you friends, this does not lead to any visual disturbance. So the patient is perfectly normal and he can see perfectly normal. So there is no visual impairment whether it is due to KF ring or whether it is due to sunflower cataract. So there is absolutely no visual impairment in a patient with Wilson's disease. So Wilson's disease patient does not go to ophthalmologist. Medicine PG refers the patient of Wilson's disease to an ophthalmologist and there are no ocular signs as such. There's no ocular symptoms as such. The signs are KF ring and uh, the sunflower cataract as there's no loss of vision. And the visual acuity is as absolutely normal. So a case of Wilson's disease is never diagnosed by an ophthalmologist. It's a referral from medicine department to an ophthalmologist so that the KF ring is better demonstrated by an ophthalmologist. Again, I would like to emphasize there is no visual impairment in a patient with Wilson's disease. Question number seven, which is the most common psychiatric manifestation of Wilson's disease? Like we saw, the patient was presenting with depression and personality changes. But what is the most common psychiatric manifestation in a patient with Wilson's disease? Option A, personality changes. Option B, depression. Option C, anxiety. And option D, psychosis. Yes, friends, what is the most common psychiatric manifestation in a patient of Wilson's disease? Yes, many of you would have confused and put the answer as depression as we saw in our patient. But no, here the most common psychiatric manifestation of any Wilson's disease is simple personality changes. Depression is only seen in about 20 to 30 percent of the patients. Personality changes are the most common psychiatric manifestation of Wilson's disease. Again, the severity of the psychiatric symptoms correlate with what? With the neurological findings of Wilson's, with the liver damage associated with Wilson's, with both or with none. Can you guess friends? The severity of psychiatric symptoms of a patient of Wilson's disease correlates with yes it is the neurological findings and not both. The liver damage is independent of the psychiatric symptoms. The psychiatric symptoms are rather independent of the liver damage in a patient of Wilson's disease. Again this is an important confuser friends. Copper being deposited in the putamen and the globus pallidus in Wilson's disease produces personality changes and depression. This is we saw. This is what we saw till now. Personality changes and depression in a young male with a family history where his mother also had depression and on ophthalmoscopy slit lamp, KF ring was also seen. So, what is the disease in which iron gets deposited in the globus pallidus, producing dystonia? So, copper getting deposited in the globus pallidus in Wilson's disease producing personality changes in depression. Dystonia caused by the deposition of iron in globus pallidus. What is the name of the disease, friends? Anyone, what is the name of this disease? Can I give you a clue? Eye of a tiger sign is seen in the MRI of this disease. Eye of a tiger sign. Yes, it is the Halliburton Sparks disease. Halliburton Sparks disease due to the deficiency of the pantotenate kinase deficiency, popularly known as the PK enzyme, pantotenate kinase deficiency, leading to the deposition of the iron in bilateral basal ganglia, especially the globus pallidus, classically giving rise to the appearance of eye of a tiger appearance. So this is, a this is an enzyme deficiency of the iron metabolism in the brain, leading to deposition of the iron in the globus pallidus, producing the chief symptom of dystonia. So, 
This is a classical picture showing the eye of a tiger appearance in a patient of Halliburton Spatz disease. So this is the iron getting deposited in the globus pallidus, classically producing the Halliburton Spatz disease or the eye of a tiger sign in a patient with Halliburton Spatz disease. This is how you integrate friend. When you see copper getting in globus pallidus, have you seen any other disease where other things getting deposited? Iron getting deposited, this is known as Halliburton Spatz disease. Let's see the radiological findings of Wilson's disease. In neuro Wilson's disease, that is a person presenting with extra pyramidal symptoms and cerebellar symptoms like our patient, the most frequent abnormality on brain MRI is symmetrical increased T2 signal in the potamin followed by quadrate nucleus. This is what we exactly found in our patient. Symmetric increased T2 signal in the putamen and the quadrate. So this was a classical finding in the image which I have given. Followed by involvement of the globus pallidus, thalamus, midbrain and the pons. The thalamic involvement is typically ventrolateral. So the cerebellum is also involved in the late stages of the disease. So this is classically showing symmetric hyperintensities in the globus pallidus that is the putamen and the caudate nucleus. So classically showing symmetric hyperintensities in the globus pallidus that is the putamen and the caudate nucleus. Again the CSF is white so water is white this is a T2 weighted image. So hyperintensities in the caudate and the putamen in a T2 weighted MRI is the earliest MRI finding of a patient of Wilson's disease. Again, this is a classical MCQ, my dear friend. The face of Jane Panda sign can be seen in a patient of Wilson's disease. It refers to T2 hyperintensity of the midbrain, excluding the red nuclei, which forms the eyes of the panda, and the lateral pass reticulata of the substantia nigra, which form the ears of the panda, which appear hypointense, thereby giving the appearance of a face of a Jane Panda appearance. So the face of the Jane Panda appearance in Wilson's is rarely seen but it's a stock question which has been repeated in multiple MCQs. That's why I did not include this image so that this question would have become easier if the face of Jane Panda was given. But this finding is rarely seen so I included the most common image that is hyperintensity in the caudate and the putam. Face of Jane Panda sign can be seen in Wilson's. It is due to the sparing of the red nucleus. This is very important my dear friend. The sparing of the red nucleus of the midbrain and the substantia nigra which form the eyes and the ears of the panda. So let's see how the face of the panda of the Jane panda looks like. Yes, this is the classical description of the face of the Jane panda. These are the ears of the panda due to the sparing of the pars reticulata of the substantia nigra. These are the eyes of the panda due to the sparing of the red nucleus of the midbrain. So these two are spared leading to the classical appearance of the face of the Jane Panda appearance, the sparing of the red nucleus and the substantia nigra of the midbrain and copper is de deposited all through throughout the midbrain. But again I would like to emphasize friends, copper is first deposited in the putamen followed by caudate and the globus pallidus and the midbrain and the pons and then the cerebellum. So let's see our approach to extrapyramidal symptoms in a case of Wilson's or any other neuropsychiatric disorders where the extrapyramidal symptoms, the chorea, ethitosis and the hemibalismus are predominating. We need to give the correct history, then only we will reach closer to the diagnosis. In medicine cases, history is always important my dear friend. History is as important as clinical findings and let's see how does history point to various neurological disorders. Age. If the age of onset is at a younger, younger age, then you need to suspect genetic causes of the disease or some syndrome such as the Tourette syndrome. So Tourette syndrome is classically diagnosed at a younger age whereas Parkinson's disease is classically diagnosed at an older age. And Huntington's chorea is also a genetic disease which has, which has a younger age of onset. So both Tourette syndrome and Parkinson's disease. Tourette syndrome and Huntington's chorea are diagnosed at a younger age and the presentation is early. Parkinson's disease usually present in the fifth or the sixth decade of the life. Past history. Past history of jaundice involves hepatic dysfunction and is seen in Wilson's. And the classical extrapyramidal manifestation of Wilson's is 
bat with bat winging tremors so jaundice in wilson's involves hepatic involvement and infection in rheumatic fever can cause to sydenham's chorea and sydenham's chorea is one of the major criteria for the diagnosis of rheumatic fever drug history there has been multiple drugs causing parkinsonism like symptoms and the most common of them are the antipsychotic which can cause drug induced parkinsonism family history family history is very important for a case like wilson's disease which is autosomal recessive in inheritance and can you name a chorea which is autosomal dominant in inheritance yes it is the huntington's chorea which is autosomal dominant in inheritance and wilson's disease which is autosomal recessive in inheritance and you need to differentiate between them and you need to draw a pedigree chart to analyze the different members of the family involved and you need to warn the family members of the possible occurrence in the next generation so this is how history is very important in a case of wilson's disease or any other extra pyramidal symptoms age torrent is diagnosed at a younger age and parkinson's at a later age past history of jaundice is seen in wilson's disease and infection is seen in rheumatic fever drug history drug induced parkinsonism by antipsychotics family history is important in diagnosing diseases like wilson's disease and huntington's chorea so that's all for today friend i'll come up tomorrow with another clinical vignette integrating our knowledge of medicine with anatomy and physiology till then goodbye take care